All right, uh, so I guess we'll start uh, right now itself. Uh, I just want to ask before we start, if you guys have questions, feel free to ask. Um, this live is basically going to be a continuation of the supply and demand zones live that we had, uh, I believe. When did we have it? This was six days. I think we had it like around the third or something like that. Um, so we went over basically the basics and how to uh, plot all these zones and stuff like that. And today we're just going to go over how you can use the MACD and stuff, the MACD mainly, to be able to trade supply, uh, supply and demand zones in case you're not that familiar with being able to trade uh, based off of price and volume analysis, which will be a topic that we'll go over soon in the future. But at least I want to, uh, you know, at least somewhat finish off this topic of supply and demand zones because as you guys have seen it's very important to know supply and demand zones and it could actually be one of the more profitable st strategies that you can use to trade because it kind of I'll show you guys how it's going to be how that's the case because it reduces your risk and it also gives you it just like sets it caps your risk so so it's definitely a beautiful strategy and institutions follow it so that's definitely uh, something I want to make sure you guys know fully or know most about but um before we start does again anyone have any questions do you guys want me to go over basically the basics of how to plot these zones or did you guys already watch either the recording or um, attend a live you guys could type in main chat uh, if you guys can't speak even if one of you guys want me to go over how to plot it I'll plot it I'll show you guys how to plot it I mean if not then um, then I'll just get started really all of you guys have watched the video so far uh, just to let you know, the video I'm talking about is the second one right over here on our channel, which is as supply and demand zones, the most profitable reversal strategy. Uh, you guys are all saying that you watched it. You've not watched it yet, and okay. I mean, were you able to attend the live or? Yeah, I guess why not. A, a good refresher okay so I know you might understand the basics but I'll go over basically how to plot um, supply and demand zones the way I do again this is my preference this is what I found uh, profitable so I just want to share it to you with you guys but the way I personally plot supply and demand zones is actually using the hike and ashy candles and if you guys don't know what that means, it's basically you guys probably are used to seeing just regular candles, something like this, right? But the hike and ashy candles kind of show the strength of momentum. So you guys actually might see me using bars instead of candles, but today, I'm so sorry, my throat's so dry. But today we'll be going over the hike and ashy candles and how you can actually use that to plot your supply and demand zones. Just give me a second, let me clear my throat. <coughs> okay, sorry about that. I'm now we're good. But basically, you can use actually hike and ashy candles to plot out very accurate supply and demand zones. And these supply and demand zones obviously are somewhat respected by most institutions since institutions are the ones that move the market right institutions use supply and demand zones to be able to know when to either short a position or go long on a position long is basically bullish while shorting is bearish right and since um i'll just give a basic brief overview of what supply and demand zones are a demand zone is basically, let's say a stock was trading down, right? If it were to trade into a demand zone, there's a higher probability that the stock would reverse from trading bearish into an upwards bullish momentum, right? So let's just say, for example, we had a zone right here 
for SPY, we're on ticker SPY by the way, and SPY traded downwards into this demand zone. Because of this area, we will have a reversal into the upside. Now you might be asking, wait, why is this the case? Well, the reason is, the way you plot these zones is you look for an area where there was a huge jump in price in the opposite direction of the previous momentum. And what I mean by this is, say we take this this time frame, we take this area right over here, right? And there is this, we had this bearish movement for these, that we're on the two hour time frame, by the way. So we had bearish movement for the, you know, past few days, right? But then on Monday, we had a bearish candle, but then the next day we had a bunch of bullish candles for a remainder of you know the week and stuff like that and basically this is where the zone would uh, you know form and if you guys could just mute your mic if you don't mind so in this case when the stock is trending downwards and then immediately trends upwards this is where a demand zone would form and the reason why a demand zone would form is because once the stock trades upward and it starts moving very quickly this basically leaves a lot of unfilled buying orders right that institutions have it's just left unfilled and institutions don't always just you know uh, cancel an order if it's not filled more likely or not they're gonna leave those orders unfilled for the next time that the stock trades back into this area so they could buy in right so this is how these forms, uh, this is how these zones form. So these are the uh, demand zone forms. So again, to go over it, right? We have this bearish movement and, uh, and then all of a sudden we had this very strong bullish movement. And we would go, the way we plot this on the hike and ashy, right? The way we plot demand zones is since we're going according to the previous movement before the bullish movement for demand zones, we'll go to the previous candle and basically plot from the high of that candle to the most recent low before that candle, right? So I'll just tell you what I mean. Basically, we plotted the high of that candle and we plotted the low of the most recent candle, which is the prior candle before it, okay? So this is basically our demand zone right now. And as I said, this demand zone is basically an area where there's just a bunch of unfilled buying orders, right? Because the price moved up so quickly and the institutions did not have their um, orders filled in. You guys can relate yourselves. How many times have you tried getting into an option uh, contract and then the price just moved up so quickly that you just weren't able to get in because you had a limit order, right? And it's just too quick, and it's just you're too late to enter in. The price just either pumps or drops, and it's just you can't get in, right? So that's basically how it works for the demand zones, right? So that's how you plot it. That's what the demand zones are. So it's vice versa for supply zones. Supply zones is basically a you look for a huge momentum towards the downside, and you look, you look prior to it to plot your supply zone, right? So demand zone is basically an area where it's just a bunch of unfilled buying orders, right? That are left uh, unfilled. Versus supply zone is an area where there's a bunch of selling orders that are left unfilled. So the way we first of all plot these supply zones is we look for a big bearish movement. In this case, we look right here, right? You could see that we have the these uh, consecutive consecutive strong bearish candles and we go to the candle before that and just like how we plotted the top the high of the candle before the bullish candles for the demand zone we're going to actually plot the low of the first of the previous bullish candle right to the highest point of any pre recent previous candle but since this candle is already you know is that has the most previous high we're just gonna uh, you know chart according to that and there we go this rectangle right now is oops this rectangle right now is basically the supply zone
that we're going to look forward to, right? Look forward to trade for these um, for this scenario, right? So we plot from the low of the candle to the high of uh, to the most previous high, and this forms our supply zone, which again is basically an area where there's a bunch of unfilled selling orders. Now, how do we trade this? Why is this important? Well, let's go back to demand zones. In this situation, right, we plot this demand zone right here. Spy traded upwards, and it stayed in this um, this area. By the way, if there's a rally and then immediately drops afterward, this area is called a distribution zone, right? We'll learn about that later. I'll go in depth later on another live what these distribution zones and accumulation zones mean, but that's not too important right now. But Basically, we had spy trading upwards, and, and we had wow, we had spy trading up to this area, and then it immediately fell back down, right? And then when spy started trading downwards, and we hit this area, you could see that spy actually had a reversal, right? Why is this? Well, because as I said, this area, this demand zone is is an area that's filled with unfilled buying orders, so the second spy approaches this zone or either enters this zone all these unfilled buying orders get start it starts getting filled right by all these people that are trying to sell whether it be institutions or us retail investors all these uh, just unfilled buying orders start getting filled and basically what this means is that the buying volume is going to overpower the selling volume right and it'll create a reversal into the upside and that's what's exactly what happened here Keep in mind, no strategy is going to be 100%. No strategy is going to give you 100% win rate all the time. That's impossible. So this this strategy at least reduces your risk and gives you a higher probability to enter profitable trades, right? So the reason why this is uh, less risky than other strategies is because institutions follow this, right? So more often than not, Again, emphasis in more often than not, right? So there's chances of failure. But more often than not, institutions are going to respect these zones and they're going to trade according to these zones. So in this scenario, an institution would trade this, it would start buying shares right over here, right? And they would start taking profits as spy rallies into the upside. And then now if we go into the supply zone scenario, we have the supply zone right over here and we can see that you know spy kind of trades within the zone for a little bit but eventually it drops and we would enter enter in puts over here right just like we would enter in calls over here we enter in puts in the supply zone to be able to profit off of the downward reversal movement right so that's basically how supply and demand zones work that's how you can plot it using the hike and ash candles now you can obviously um, there's ways to plot it on regular candles and if you use bars like me you can plot it off bars as well but I found the most accurate and easier way to plot it is using Heiken Ashi candles so that's just in my opinion the easier way to plot it and the better way to look at it before we continue this anyone have any questions oh we do okay um does those candles only work on higher time channels okay so basically what he's asking is do these do you plot these zones and do you use the high Ashi on higher time frames right well here here's basically a good answer to that the higher the time frame you go the less noise you have and the less noise you have the easier you'll be able to plot out trends right and the stronger the trend would be but also the higher the time frame you are the less opportunities you have because stuff will be hidden right like zones will be hidden and I'll show what I mean so basically what I mean by what I said right the stronger this, uh, the trend the higher the time frame these zones this supply zone for example and these demand zones for ex and this demand zone for example is more likely to be respected because it's at a higher time frame right so this is institutions look at higher time frames. They don't always look at shorter time frames. The most used time frames by institutions, from what I last remembered, 
is two hour, right? Two hour, one hour, and the 15 minute, and the three minute. So the, to look at, you know, to swing trade or look at the overview of the market, actually, of course, and the daily, like everyone, everyone uses the da daily as well, you know, to get an overview. But whenever, whenever institutions want to plot zones, they look at a two hour and one hour, and then use the 30 minute and 15 minute for reference. But as we go to shorter time frames, as you can see, there's a lot more noise, right? And hold on. Let me, uh, let me go back, let me extend this. You could see, oops, one second, just give me one moment. You could see that there's just a lot more noise. Like even with the one hour candle, there's just a lot more noise. And this could cause you to plot out zones that are not going to be so respected. Like right over here, right? For example, this is not necessarily a really good zone, but we could have plotted supply zone right over here, right? But you can see that the institutions and the market did not really respect this zone. So the higher the time frame you plot these zones on, the more likelihood of these zones to be respected, right? So that's basically general. Now this doesn't mean that if you go on the let's say for example um, the 15 minute time frame right and you were to see like this supply zone right over here for example right you could have plotted this supply zone right here again you see how quickly I did this this is why I love the high canash you could just easily just spot you know all these big movements and just yeah just easily plot out these zones that's why I can actually in my opinion is better than, uh, than uh, regular candles or bars so you can plot out the supply zone in the 15 minute candle and it's not like it's not going to be respected it's just there's less chance of these zones to be respected but in this scenario you could see that it was clearly respected and that's a good thing right so again as I said it's not always going to be respected in smaller time frames if you were to go according to this um, in this supply zone right here you can see that um, you can see that it wasn't respected here. Yes, of course, there was a little bit of a hesitation here when it came into this zone, right? Because we had this strong rally, but once we got into this zone, it kind of traded a little bit uh, weaker compared to before. But as you saw, it was not respected. So this is why when you plot zones, you want to start off by bigger time frames. You want to start off by two hours, right? You're going to start off by two hours and then you might want to go to one hour or the 15 minute just to see if there's actually zones that you can plot out, right? So that's why that's basically hopefully answers your question. Uh, does anyone else have any questions related to anything I said or anything you guys are curious about so far? Literally, there's no bad question. Even if I went over it and you didn't hear it or you don't understand it, please ask. Because the last thing I want you to do is go listen to what I said, but interpret it wrong and then use it wrong in the market tomorrow or any other day. Excuse me for that voice crack. And just lose, you know. And I wouldn't want you guys to lose. The whole reason I'm doing this is because I don't want you guys to lose in your trades. So definitely let me know if you guys have questions. Yeah, um, supply and demand zones definitely work for buying uh, equity. I'm pretty sure that's what you meant is saying equality. Uh, but that's how institutions trade, right? Institutions don't really trade options, if you guys didn't know that. Institutions trade shares because, think about it, options are riskier than shares, right? Because options has time decay and stuff like that, theta basically, right? While shares you can hold on for years and time decay is not going to work against it, right? So. Institutions are most likely, you know, 90%, 99% of times, they always trade equity, right? Which is basically shares. So if you, um, if you want to trade shares, absolutely go ahead. Do keep in mind, bigger, high cap stocks, blue chip stocks, you know, ETFs, they're more likely or not going to, they're more likely going to be able to have zones that are more respected than penny stocks, right? Because penny stocks are not always traded by institutions. So 
you're not always going to see these zone respected, zones respected, but you can definitely still plot these zones and have it respected on penny stocks and stuff like that. So if you want to use this many for uh, many, if you can use this method for penny stocks, it could definitely work. Like you could see the supply zone I plotted a while back on this penny stock called Hut. We could see it. It got rejected in the supply zone. Sorry, excuse me. Excuse me. Um, got um, the supply zone was ex uh, respected, and we could see that reverse from the uh, from a bullish movement into a bearish movement, right? You could even take this uh, this demand zone right here. You could see that it was respected twice actually, which is which makes if you guys uh, if you guys again didn't watch the previous video, the more times a zone is uh, tested, the weaker it gets, right? Because obviously, if it's tested right, these unfilled since these areas are unfilled orders right all these unfilled orders are going to get bought which means that there's less unfilled orders making these zones weaker than what it was before right so the rule of thumb when it comes to these zones is the first time the stock right test the zone test the zone that we're looking at whether it be supply zone or demand zone it has the higher it has a higher probability of it working your way so just keep that in mind Uh, so hopefully that um, yeah that hopefully that answered your question, Mad Max. The next question is, could you go over how you will decide to enter supply and demand zones? Like, what are the signs you look to look out for to you know for strong conviction? Absolutely, that's actually what this live is for. Because the other live that we had, which again, if you guys didn't watch, I go way in detail about what I basically briefly said. I missed out on a lot of stuff, so definitely go to this video. I'll actually post a link to it. Um, again, you don't have to do it today or tomorrow. I'll post a link to it and you guys could watch it when you're free. Uh, I just posted it in the announcement tab right now, but watch when you're free. This basically goes over, uh, this video goes over how to plot the zones, right? What zones are weak, right? What zones are strong? So obviously you want to go according to stronger zones, right? Because you want to be able to trade profitably and it goes a little bit more in depth so definitely watch that video uh, you can watch it across you know different amount of days you don't need to do it one shot don't burn yourself out you know what I mean so definitely watch that video but basically this whole live is going to be how I'll, how you enter and stuff like that so I'll definitely go into that but I do want to focus on any other questions if you guys do have before uh, we continue deeper into this live uh, again, it's I love teaching, trading. Uh, if you guys didn't know, I've been trading for eight years now. I'm actually only 20, so I only started trading when I was 12 years old. And when I started 12 years 12 years ago, when I started eight years ago, there was, you know, there was YouTube, of course, but there was not that much content, and a lot of people who taught trading were extremely expensive. So. I had to learn on myself, I had to use some of the resources I could use on YouTube or books and stuff like that. But eventually I started learning. I learned based off of the Wickoff strategy which is a very very in-depth strategy that institutions use. Um, I actually don't recommend watching YouTube videos on it because they briefly go over it and they don't actually explain it correctly, correctly in my term, in my opinion I mean. So one of these live, I'll actually go over it, and it's actually very detailed, right? That it will probably be a s live sessions that will be held across like three live sessions, to be honest with you. So I can't wait to teach you guys that. But from the Wickoff strategy, basically Wickoff strategy is a strategy that the institutions use to trade, right? So it's high profitable strategies. It's an old strategy as well, but I'll teach you guys that. And from the Wickoff strategy, I was able to make my own strategies, right? As you can see, like the Wickoff strategy, right? It uses supply and demand zones, but it does not go according to uh, hike and ash candles. This is what I did. Uh, this is what I made up for myself. So that's why um, I learned from that. I created my own strategy. And since then, I have taken my account to a decent amount. 
Um, I've taken three hundred dollars to twenty four k in one month, but from twenty four k I blew my account to one k because I kept on full porting every uh, trade and it was just horrible. But ever since that one k, ever since that month, eight years ago, again, which is one of the worst days of my life. But ever since that day, I have learned from my mistake. I literally do not put more than 10% of my portfolio in any trade. I take profits, I start taking profits at 5% or 10%. I have strict stop losses that I always stick to. I always stick to my setups and it's worked amazing since then. Since the $300, I have now taken my account to over $11 million. I don't want to go into specifics. Um, I found that putting a goal or just like just setting a goal to your trading makes you a lot smarter when it comes to trading and gives you a lot more thought before you enter trades and gamble so my whole goal is to use the trading funds and trading profits that I collect from all these years I'm going to be buying land in Pennsylvania and Virginia to open up dog shelters basically dog and uh, cat shelters right which it costs a lot of money of course to first of all buy the land hire dog trainers you know employees and stuff like that so that's what I'm trading for it's a project that I hope to start soon um, 11 million dollars plus is of course a lot of money but it's nothing compared to how much this project is gonna uh, cost so I actually hope to uh, start uh, funding this project and start starting this project within either this year's end or next year so that's basically my whole uh, you know thing behind trading but definitely I suggest you guys set a goal to your trading give yourself a reason to why you're trading don't make it I want to get rich because that's never gonna get you anywhere in fact that's just gonna make your account just become a gambling account you want to gamble just go sport, bet on sports to be honest with you but the way you have to look at trading is trade to grow your account versus trading to get rich quick because if you trade to get rich quick you will absolutely chase chase trades not take profits and you'll end up losing right so that's basically my whole spiel about about that and I'm sorry for all the users who've been here multiple times and heard me say the same thing but it's very important I want to drill it into your head. But, uh, again, before we continue, does anyone have any questions? Again, whatever question is, feel free to ask in the main chat or in voice. It will be my pleasure to answer them. I'll give you guys two minutes to ask any questions. And again, there's no dumb questions at all, so feel free to ask me. And I'm so sorry I'm stuttering. My, my throat is dry, so I just... And English is not my first language, unfortunately, so, <laughs> yeah. How do I find a discipline commitment? Well, that's a very interesting question and has an interesting answer. I was always addicted to uh, making money, to be honest with you. Even since a young age, like at 11 years old, um, there used to be like all these games on phones like Madden Mobile which is basically a football game right and there's all these fake currencies in-game currencies that you could uh, use to buy players and stuff like that and I used to start selling those in-game currencies to uh, other players right and that just got me started into making money and I did my research and the stock market was one of the best places to make money so that's why I entered in this whole field of trading. And that's what stuck to me. But yeah. It was definitely hard at the beginning. That's what I'll tell you for sure. You know, I was obviously a teenager, so yeah, you could you could definitely tell how hard it was for me as a teenager. Um, I'm currently twenty. By the way, you guys can hear me fine, right? I just want to make sure. And you guys can see my screen. Now oh, come on, don't leave me hanging. Someone say yes or no. 
Okay, sweet. Um, again, I'll just give one more minute for questions, and if not, then we'll just get started. And again, seriously, ask any question. I don't mind. Well, now you guys want to start answering. Okay. <laughs> one minute later, <laughs> I'm just playing with you guys. Uh, do keep in mind, please don't mention any server names, as this is a free neutral server, so in order for server owners to be okay with this happening, I try to keep server names out of this whole server, so just keep server names out of any discussion. But, okay, um, since I guess there's no questions, we'll get started. So, the main thing that I want to have this live today for, right, is how to trade these zones. So, you can trade of course any trade with two you can enter any trade in two ways the first way is of course entering a trade without confirmation versus the second way is entering a trade with confirmation right and um, obviously you know the pros and cons to each entering without confirmation uh, implements a lot more risk to your account or your position but it also gives the possibility to having a lot more profits while entering with confirmation reduces profits but also reduces your risks as well. I personally think the smarter decision, right, is entering with confirmation. So that's what I that's why I always trade based off of confirmation. And if you guys haven't seen my trading log, it's I don't, I don't, not a person to glow, but it's not a bad trading log. Like I always have above a 90% for every single month, right? Last month was 97%, which is basically 98%. We had 48 trades, right? 49 trades, 48 wins with one loss. And the reason why it's so high is because, first of all, I trade supply and demand zones. I trade based off of um, price and volume analysis, right? And I, mainly always trace trade off of confirmation so I don't just enter in when I just feel like oh I think something's gonna happen no I enter in when there's confirmation so today I'm gonna be talking about how to enter trade how to enter supply and demand zones with confirmation right so we're just gonna use these examples for now let's say we want to start off with trading off the supply zone um, situation right we could do, I'm gonna go over two strategies. The first strategy is, sorry, I'm just flip, flipping through my notes. The first strategy is the strategy I personally use, which is price and volume analysis. This is obviously gonna be tricky for some people since they don't know exactly how to do this. That's absolutely fine. Uh, we'll definitely go over how to do it in depth in another live session, right? Um, Hold on, let me just uh, pull up what we were looking at. But I use bars, by the way, instead of candles. I just find it much more easier to read. Much easier to read, not much more easier to read. Um, but let's say we go according to this supply zone, right? Uh, by the way, so once you plot your supply zones with the Heiken Ashi, you don't necessarily have to be in the Heiken Ashi. You can at least absolutely stay in it. But I just prefer going back to bars or candles, whatever is your preference, right? So you could, and then you could use the rectangles or the zones that you created to uh, basically trade off these zones. So how would you trade this supply zone, right? Well, when it comes to price, uh, when it comes to volume and price analysis, what you would wait for is you would wait for the upward movement into the supply zone, and you would wait for a lot of volume to enter into this area, right? So for example, none of this area is good volume compared to this volume right here, right? This volume is very strong and very uh, big. There's just a lot of volume, right? And this, all of this volume is nothing compared to that. Now when we get to this area right over here, you can see the volume increases a lot. And it basically shows you that there's a lot of uh, buyers or sellers that are behind this movement and there's going to be a movement that's up, that's going to be coming in, right? So, for example, once we see a, uh, this huge volume spike around this area right here, you would wait 
for the stock to break below or almost break below the zone, right? So let me extend it here. So for example, where I would personally enter is right over here, right? Uh, let me change this so you guys can actually see it. The reason why I would enter this, what the heck? The reason why I'd enter this uh, circle, you guys can basically see. You guys can. Okay, I don't know why it's being weird, uh, but the reason why I would enter this right, the circle right here, why I would enter here, is because we, as you can see right below on my cursor, we're having volume picking up, right? And first of all, we ha now had these candles. Hold on. So let me backtrack. I'm obviously not going to day trade using the two hour time frame. So what I would do is I would either go to the 15 minute, right? Or I'll go to three minute and I'll trade based upon that. But just to go back to two hour time frame so we could see what I'm looking at. Again, the whole explanation to this is on the other video. So just make sure you uh, go back to that but when you have time. But I'll enter in the I would enter in short position, which is basically puts right in this area right here. And you could see if we did that, we would actually profit a decent amount because we'd be trading from this area all the way to this area. So I would enter, you know, right below the break of the zone and stuff like that, not stuff like that. So I would enter in either before we break the zone or right after we break in the zone, because this is confirmation that we're reversing, right? Because we in this situation we broke above the zone and we started reversing downwards and since we broke below the zone or we're about to break below the zone this gives us confirmation that we have more of a likelihood for these puts right if we were to enter to profit versus um and in ending up a loss the way you can um set your stop losses according to this you can either set your stop loss above the zone or to the most recent high of the uh, most recent high of a candle. So in this case, that would be 470, right? You don't want to go all the way up here because that's just, I mean, you technically can, depends on your risk management, but this is obviously a lot more risk compared to setting a tight stop loss at 470, 54, right? So that's why you can set your stop losses and you can start taking profits once it starts reversing, right? So hopefully there that um, that basically you you ask can you explain confirmation? Basically confirmation is when you wait for movement to work towards the position you're trying to get. And what I mean by that, say you want to enter puts in the scenario, right? you would wait for bearish indication which is basically in this case the increased volume right and the bearish candles these two candles that are red or bearish right and that's confirmation because that's giving you confirmation to enter in these trades with higher probably higher uh, chance of you profiting off of these puts so that's basically what uh, confirmation means so hopefully I answered your question but that's how you trade um, for supply zones using price and volume analysis. The other way uh, for demand zones, I mean, it's basically the same thing, right? You wait for the increase in volume to show that there's a bunch of uh, buyers and sellers in this area entering this situation. And then you would enter in around an area where it's about to either break or it's already broken above the demand zone and then you can enter and calls you right so that's a trade with confirmation and you should be able to have a higher chance of having this trade be profitable right and again as I said before in the beginning of the live the, there's no strategy that's going to be a hundred percent win rate all the time but strategies like um, the supply and demand zones have a higher percentage of you profiting in the end, right? So that's why it's pretty crucial to know supply and demand zones. So, and again, just as we uh, set our stop losses here, the way you set your stop losses for these demand zones is you would either set it below the demand zone 
or to the most recent low candle, right? So that would be either 450.97 when it comes to the candle, or you could set it to 448 right below the zone. So that's basically how you trade when it comes to a price and volume analysis. Obviously, it's not that um, simple, but I'll definitely go in depth in another live since this live is taking place so late itself. I'm already like partially falling asleep. So we'll definitely go over this in depth price and volume analysis basically in depth in a later time. And you can use this for basically any strategy, right? So, and if you guys can actually see, you can see on my chart, I do not really have any indicators. That's because institutions do not actually trade based off, institu uh, in based off of indicators as much. And they actually trade based off of price analysis and volume analysis, which is down here. So that's why I just trade based off of that. I don't have like the SMA, the EMA, the RSIs, the stochastics. I don't have those indicators, right? I just trade based off of this. I make my own TA. I draw my own, you know, channels, whatever it be. Support and resistances. Of course, this is not accurate um, trends. This is actually horrible. But you guys get what I mean. So I'll. Of course, there's so many lives coming ahead, so I'll explain as much as I can in those lives. But, um, no, no, no need to thank me. Uh, yeah, the most analysts do charge money for these classes. In fact, in the future, I'm going to have some analysts be able to do it for free, but some of them I know are going to actually charge. But I'm going to ask them to charge at a cheaper rate since it's going to be for a larger crowd, right? So yeah, um, it's a pleasure bringing this information out to you guys. It, 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 I love teaching, trading, right? I actually taught my wife how to trade. And yeah, I know you guys are going to think I'm crazy for having a wife at 20, but trust me, the best decision I ever made other than converting into a Muslim. But um, I taught my wife how to trade and she's amazing at trading. So uh, I'd love to tr uh, teach, so if you guys have any questions, again, just feel free to ask and I'll answer whatever question you guys have. But before I go on to using the next indicator, like an actual indicator, can you guys confirm, and I actually want most of you guys to actually confirm in the main chat that you did understand what I said briefly what I, when it comes to price analysis, right, and entering with confirmation. Can you guys either say if you understood it or if you have any questions about it? And I can either answer your question or um, or look to answer it another uh, time. Okay, sweet. So we're actually getting questions now. Um, okay, so Fletch asked what time frame looks like you're on the two hour chart. So. Let's, instead of using a previous example, let's actually go to modern time. Modern time, why did I say modern time? But um, let's go to, let's go to, uh, okay. That just messed up, give me a second. Let's now, um, let's just go to this area right here. So, okay. You know what, let me just, this was again in the previous video, but I'll briefly say it. The way I start off is, um, forget this, let's go back to Heiken Ashi. What I would do is, the way I'd start off the day is, I first of all plot these zones not after the market ends, but before the market starts. So that means uh, the day of, before the market opens, so like the day of the market open, the new market open, before market open, like 30 minutes or an hour. I would start plotting these zones, right? And the way I would do it is I would start off at the two hour, right? And I would plot these zones. So for example, we this is a perfect zone that I actually had, which I cleared, which was this demand zone right here, right? So we plot this demand zone on the two hour. And then from the two hour, once I plot a decent amount of zones, right? We have the supply zone right over here. And um, we have this other supply zone right over here. No, not this. We have this other supply zone right over here, right? I would then go from the two hour to sometimes the one hour, but most likely I always go to the 15 minute. 
and then in the 15 minute what I would do is I would go over and just make sure these zones I plotted are valid right or strong and then I would see if there's any other strong zones that are within um, that I missed out because as I said the higher the time frame the less noise there is right so that's why you'll miss out on some zones if you use higher time frames but keep in mind the lower the time frames the weaker the zones are right so for example we could use this supply zone right here on the 15 minute and we could see that it was actually respected right over here right we could see spy trading upwards to it but then it reversed into a downside once it came close to the zone right so this is how this is basically how it goes this is what I do before the market starts and then personally the way I uh, trade is this, the second the market opens I go to my day trading setup which is this and uh, uh, dang it's not gonna show it since okay one second let me fix this so then the next thing that would happen is I'll come to my day trading chart day trading setup right uh, just so that you know this is the option and this is the stock chart this is the option uh, option uh, chart and this is the option buy buying and selling window right and I would go according to I would trade the rest of the day using shorter time frame which I personally use is three minutes so rest of the day I would just use three minutes and since I plotted out already as you guys saw these zones I can now see it in uh, I can now see it in this um, area right here as you can see like this is the white box that we plotted right and we could see here SPY actually traded close to this demand zone and we saw that we had a reversal into the upside once we came close to it right so not only can you trade uh, demand zones or supply zones within um, within the range or when it enters the range you could also trade it coming close to a range so uh, yeah that's basically hopefully that answers your question uh, which uh, Fletch. So, which time frame? Hopefully, that uh, answers your question. Uh, Mad Max, what do you mean by confused? Are you actually confused, or let me know? Uh, the next question is, why not use ES since futures run throughout the day and SPY is an ETF and it follows e ES? That's absolutely correct. But I personally don't trade futures, just like I don't trade crypto and forex. The reason is I don't like the idea of having a 24-7 open market, right, or close to 24-7 because this adds a lot more uh, risk, obviously, and you'll tend to trade more than you should. And ES, in my opinion, is just so much more expensive, it's so much, it's more expensive than a SPY contracts because, as you guys already know, SPY contracts are fairly cheap compared to ES, right? So like around $200 versus ES, if you look at it, it's insanely, ex ex insanely, it's a, um, insanely expensive, as you guys already know. Uh, let's, let me show you. As you can see, it's like around $2,000, right? So that's why, um, that's why I do not trade ES as much. Just give me a second. Uh, I don't know why this is glitching out. Alright, uh, let's see. Oh, 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 why not plot S and, S and D zones? So basically, why not plot supply and demand zones? Absolutely, I mean, you could definitely do that. And then you could go according to that for whenever you trade SPY or something, right? So what he's saying is, what he's basically asking is, can you, for example, uh, plot a supply or demand zone on ES and then use it to trade SPY, right? You definitely can, because as I said before, SPY trades alongside um, ES, so it definitely can work. Uh, just give me a second, I don't know why. Uh, stupid uh 
I don't know, the volume bars are showing. My laptop is kind of glitching out. But, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, how do you decide when con which contracts to buy? Seems like you are always in and out of in out of the money contracts. Yes, I'm always entering out of the money contracts because um, the deeper in the money you go, less volume there is. Just like how there's going to be less volume for uh, farther out of the money contracts. So I always try going for contracts that end with zero because that always has the most volume when it comes to options and you want to always have the most option, most volume when it comes to options because the less volume the ha you have on the contract, the less likelihood of it being able, be you being able to actually exit the trade or enter the trade, right? So that's basically my whole spiel on uh, contracts or entering contracts, which contracts I enter. I always enter in most preferably, preferably the contracts ending in zero, and if not, then I enter in contracts ending with five, since contracts that enter with five are the second most used option strikes. But uh, yeah, does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, I plan to have this live done in 30 minutes or something like that because it's getting very late and I do want to order food since I have not eaten any dinner yet which is crazy because it's 2.21 a.m. for me as you guys can see on the side over here but okay, now since most of you guys trade based off of indicators what we're going to go off of is a very good indicator to trade uh, supply and demand zones off of and this is the MACD. Now, um, I want you guys to actually type in chat how many of you guys have heard the MACD before or used it before. I want to see basically, uh, please, like most of you actually type in ma the main chat how many of you guys are actually familiar with the MACD as an indicator. Okay, Han has. Han's smart, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> Yeah, so the reason, again, why I uh, I use only, as you guys saw, um, the reason why I only, I, I literally have no indicators, right? Because every indicator in the market is lagged, and the only non-lagged indicators are price and volume, right? Because these are always real-time. It shows it as it's happening. So that's why I personally use... Um, that's why I personally always use price price analysis and volume analysis, and I don't use any other indicators. That's why even though I'm showing the MACD, as um, Han over Han said over here, is delayed, right? So that puts a little bit more risk into it because it's constantly moving as it's it's just delayed and delayed uh, indicators not are not always gonna guarantee you more success guarantee you success compared to live indicators. And only live indicators around are price and volume. So if anyone ever tells you that they can make a indicate lagged indicator live, that's impossible. So just so that you know. Um, uh, but yeah, basically, since most of you guys know how to use it, uh, I'll just give like the way you can use um, the way you can use the MACD in your trading so if you're thinkorswim the way you can add it is uh, let's go back to the Heiken Ashi again the, actually this works better with the Heiken Ashi so what you would do the way you would work with the Heiken Ashi and MACD right as I said though what you want to do is you want to either start off with the four hour right or the two hour and you want to plot these zones and then from there you want to go to t smaller time frames to actually trade these zones so let's first of all add the uh, the what's it called why am I blanking out the um the MACD right so if we type in MACD on 
thinkorswim we'll find it right here you can enter it and here's your MACD rate um, for this instance uh, you know what no I was gonna delete uh, remove my uh, la uh, my volume indicator but it's gonna come in handy later on so I'll just leave it as is but let's just say the way um, so as I said you want to plot zones on higher time frames right and then after that you want to either go to 30 minute or 15 minute to be able to trade according to the um, MACD right so let's say we plot it out as we as you saw before we plotted out these two zones on the two hour right so we already plotted out these zones and let's say the day is currently trading right now and we're over here we can start using the MACD as a way to enter in puts so we can play the reversal into the downside right so the way you want to look at it is the MACD basically shows the strength of a movement so the farther away it is from the line the stronger the movement is but the closer it gets to the midline by, li by line I'm talking about this midline right here the closer it gets to it the weaker the momentum come uh, is right and of course since uh, the basic rule of thumb is the weaker the the weaker the momentum the more likelihood of a reversal right so that's why you want to look for low low momentum and stuff like that so this is where the MACD comes in very useful so how exactly to trade off of this right now let's go to this uh, let's go, just use the, continue using the supply zone um, example right so the way you want to look at this on the MACD if you look down here you'll see that you have a light blue line and an orangish line and that's absolutely fine like if you use trading view I'm pretty sure it's like bright blue and dark orange or something like that but it's basically the same thing right and whenever the blue line crosses the orange uh, line this usually indicates for a bearish movement right so that's how we would tie this into the zones right or the supply zones for example we would see right over here right we had this uh, zone plotted out and we could see right over here we started having this crossover by the um, by the uh, MACD over here by this light blue line and we could have entered into puts once it fully cleared and we could have had we could have entered probably around um, one of uh, 433 and we could have exited around 428 which is immense profits right so that's basically how I use the indicators for uh, supply zones the way supply zones work I mean uh, the way the MACD works for supply zone if it breaks below if the blue line crosses the orange line and continues trending below it then it's more likely a reason for you to um, enter puts right so that's how you do it for puts and supply zones it's basically vice versa for calls you enter uh, calls once the blue line crosses the orange line and as you can see here you could have entered like right over here and you would have obviously missed out on profits but you would have made some profits so that's basically how to use the MACD when it comes to trading these zones it's actually not that complicated right and then also you want to see how far away these lines are from the midline so if these lines are farther away from the midline there's less likelihood for these for the momentum afterwards if there were to be a reversal to even happen or to be strong a perfect example right right over here we had um we had uh the line staying close to the midline sorry i was just thinking for a second and because of and then because of that we had this eventual downside right but this demand zone this first time we tested it if you see we did cross it we did cross the blue with the orange line and that's amazing but um yeah uh sorry i just totally lost my train of thought what was i saying um 
I don't know, I'll get back to it if I remember, remember it. But, um, basically, yeah, that's how I use the MACD when it comes to trading, uh, supply zones and demand zones, you know? So, keep that in mind, definitely. But that's basically how to use the MACD when it comes to trading these zones. And it's very straightforward, right? You could easily, um, oh, this is what I was saying. So the farther away it is from the mid price, the less likelihood of the momentum afterwards to be strong. So for example, this area right here, if we were to enter in uh, calls right when this blue line entered the, or uh, crossed the orange line, you could enter in calls right here, right? and you could have only trimmed out here and that's absolutely fine that's an amazing profit but again as you saw the the lines are farther away from the midpoint right so it's not as strong the momentum is strong and there's less likelihood of a reversal in the first place right so we could see that this reversal into the upside was very short-lived and that's the reason is because you could see here clearly the MACD was far away from the midline compared to its previous uh, previous uh, times I guess you could say distance from yeah thank you um, again Han thank you again for someone explaining that's amazing but yeah that's basically how to trade the MACD um, can you guys tell me if you somewhat understood that? If I told you guys how to um, plot it, how to look at it, and how to trade it versus whether it be price and volume analysis or uh, MACD, using the MACD. And again, ask questions here. This is the perfect time because a lot of you guys, again, no problem, you guys could ask me questions during the day, and I don't mind that, so please ask questions. But this is a better time right now because I'm available right now to briefly explain, uh, you know, answers and stuff like that. So please ask me questions. Uh, I would love to answer them. I was actually falling asleep near the end while talking, which is crazy. <laughs> That's how sleepy I am. And I gotta wake up uh, tomorrow too, unfortunately, early. Um, but for those of you here, I am going to be not trading at all next week. I'm going to be A, F, K, or M, I, A. The reason is, is because I've been just studying and doing the homework for college and just having so many tests and doing trading that I just have had no time for my wife and my girl and I love her to death so next week from Monday to Friday it's just gonna be me and her I am not gonna be on discord as much unfortunately so if you do if you guys do have questions I'll uh, during that time period I'll definitely try answering but uh, it won't be immediate I am going to look um, I'm gonna look for other analysts to take over like to host live sessions and they'll go over their own topics, right? Like yesterday we were supposed to have uh, my fellow friend Rich, right? Is he over here? Yeah, he's online right now. So Rich was actually supposed to come on and explain option strategies, right? Like iron condors, credit spreads and stuff like that. So I'll probably have someone like him uh, host a live next uh, week or another analyst. So I'll keep in touch with you guys and let you know. But uh, yeah, I'll definitely be taking a break next week. I hope none of you guys have ill feelings towards that. I'm sorry if it's unprofessional, but of course, um, you know, my life, my my girl comes obviously first. Uh, but, okay, so back to questions. So bull when blue crosses orange, right? That's correct. And it crosses, okay. I wrote it down in the notes like this. So for supply zones, the way you look at it is if blue, if the blue line crosses below the orange line, there's a possibility of you entering into puts. And if the blue line crosses above the orange line on a demand zone, then there's a possibility of entering calls. 
Um, so, yeah, that answered your first question, right? And the second question is, move stronger, closer it is to the midpoint. Oh, wait, are you asking the... Okay, so, for example, if we're trading this demand zone, right? Are you saying that if the closer the line is to the midpoint, the following uh, reversal is going to be stronger compared to if it was farther away from the midpoint? Is that what you're asking, Tendu? Or however I said your name. Say your name. Sorry if I said it wrong. Sweet, Aji <laughs> I'm surprised I even was able to... Uh, yeah, I'm like on zero brain cells right now. So that's actually a very good question. And you know what? We're going to figure that out right now. Uh, so let's see. Let's see. Oh, you guys could look along with me. You know, you could see that uh, you could check around, check along with me anytime we had a demand zone or a supply zone. If it was followed by big distance from the midpoint or not so much let's see here let's see okay so my conclusion right is that yes the farther away um, the lines are from the midpoint the stronger the reversal movement will be right because um, think about it it's logical if we're having let's say this uh, this uptrend right and we're very far away from the midpoint if we directly go in the opposite direction that means there has to be a lot of uh, volume, whether it be buying or selling, on it towards the opposite direction, right? So that means that the uh, movement will be have to be will have to be strong. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, sorry, uh, I sign. Sorry if I didn't answer any previous question. I thought I. I didn't see a question from you before, but regardless, I'm sorry that I didn't get your qu uh, question. So your question is, okay, so the distance of the lines from the histogram shows the strength? Absolutely. So if you're in a trade, right, let's say if we entered in calls right here, or not here, let's say we enter the calls right here, right, since the blue line crossed above the orange line, you can see that the farther it gets, since, it, of course, in this scenario, we started off below the midpoint, we're obviously, since it's bullish, we're going to have to cross above the midpoint into the upside, right? So you can see the higher, the higher, the, uh, the farther the lines go away from the midpoint, the stronger it shows the momentum is. But the second it starts curving or flattening out, that's usually a good indication of either getting out, right, or, um, starting to trim but basically you guys can use it any way you want i personally don't use yeah i personally don't use the macd so much but this is a very helpful strategy to be honest with you um when it comes to uh trading supply and demand zones perfect side of the quad which next week i feel is actually going to be really crazy when it comes to market my personal opinion because I don't know if you guys realize, we've been kind of trading in a range recently, right? Am I correct? I'm pretty sure I'm correct. And... Yeah, look at this. We have been trading along this range right here. Right, we've just been in this area this entire time from Wednesday two weeks ago, I believe. Two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks ago. From Wednesday, two weeks ago, we've been just trading in this area, and it's just, it's bound to, of course, either break out or break down. Uh, so I feel like that's going to happen sometime next week. So it's definitely going to be crazy. But again, uh, 
ask me questions, please. Uh, I would love to answer it before I do end the live. This is already 240. I actually have a question for you guys. Should I order McDonald's or Wendy's? That's the biggest question. I'm in the mood for... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love how you guys responded so quick to this. But you guys took so long to ask questions and answer if you guys could hear me fine. I'm going to kill you guys. Of course, I'm... As I'm joking, by the way, YouTube, since it's going to be on YouTube, I'm not going to kill them. It's a joke. Um, easier question, okay. Uh, touche. It is an easier question. Um, food is more important than trading? Well, I mean, it's not like you can get food from... You could get food from... Yeah, I mean, obviously. But, uh, yeah, um, I'm going to give you guys a few minutes. It's 2.41. I'll give us to 250 to ask any questions you guys have. Um, oh, let me disconnect my uh, screen for a second. Ask any questions you guys have, whether it be according to anything I said, upcoming topics you guys want, um, seriously anything. Just ask away. This is the perfect time to uh, ask. Okay, all right. Let's share my stupid screen so you guys can see what I order from McDonald's. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, all right. So the first question is why hike and ashy candles for supply and demand zones? Why does that view show that regular candles or bars doesn't show? I don't know exactly what you mean uh, for the second question. So if you can explain that. But to answer your first part of the first part of the question. Why hike and ashy for supply and demand zones? It's just so much easier to read. Like, okay, I use bars again, uh, but we could go to candles since most people use candles. When you look at this, right? When you look at this, for example. Sorry, I had to burp there. Um, when you look at this, it's always going to be harder to plot it and also, hike and ashy, um, what's a good word? What's a good word? It factors in the, like, if there's any gap up or gap down in the pre market or aftermarket. So it's just so much easier. Like, looking at this with all this noise, first of all, it's going to be hard to find movements or, like, good places to start off. That's why, if you compare this to this, right? Tell me honestly, which one is it going to be easier to find? the zones on right it's obviously this one because you could clearly see when there's a reversal right and that's when you could start um plotting your uh zones so that's why i use the high connection to plot the zones and i honestly don't regret it at all it's uh it's definitely better than just using uh the just regular candles Okay, next question is, what volume indicator do you use? So this is Thinkorswim, just so that you know, if you didn't know this platform. And this volume indicator is actually custom coded by me. So I actually coded this, uh, um, this uh, indicator. But if you actually do want to, co if you do use Thinkorswim, by the way, I definitely recommend to use Thinkorswim, at least for the charts. You don't need to use it to trade since the commissions are killer on Thinkorswim, but the charge is so powerful. You could literally open a TOS account for free on the phone in like less than 10 minutes. It's so worth it just to use it for the charts. Um, but anyway, back to what I was saying, you could find this uh, volume indicator. I posted it in announcements. Uh, where is it? Did I not post it? I thought I posted it. Right here. Uh, so if you go to announcements and if you scroll up to the 6th, March 6th, you'll see that I posted the buying versus selling uh, indicator for Thinkorswim. So if you are interested in that, definitely look at that and definitely add it. It's pretty easy to add it. So 
The next question is by Spartan. He asks, how many trades are good for today? Well, that's a very good question, in my opinion. You trade when there's only good setups. You don't trade when uh, there's no good setups, right? You don't, you don't look to just trade, oh, I need to make a certain day amount today, so I'm just going to trade. No, that's not how you trade. You trade if you find something. So let's say you grow your portfolio 1% today right for example just just stop right there you're in profits one percent portfolio one an average one percent gain on a portfolio is actually very powerful i'll show you guys let's say if you started with one thousand let's say if you started with five hundred dollars right and we grew the portfolio one percent on average every single day um and since there's 252 trading days in a year obviously this means no weekends and we reinvest 100%, so that means we don't withdraw from our account. Let's just say we put $25, let's just say we put $50 every month into our trading account, right? Like we deposit $50. You could take $500 to 3K, 3.2K, no, 4. Point, no, 3. Point, why am I so stupid? You could take it to 3.2K from um, $500, and that's a lot. That is, as you see over here, 356% portfolio growth. That is absolutely insanely high, right? That's not something you should, uh, no, sorry, I'm wrong, $4,000. So you trade until you trade until you're in profits. When you're in profits, there's no reason for you to keep on trading. So that's just, there you go. Uh, hopefully that somewhat answers your question. Uh, Spartan Yeah, there's definitely a uh, You could always you could always do well always like eight thousand two hundred from just one thousand dollars and depositing one hundred dollars each month into your trading account That's amazing. Let's say we even did five hundred dollars, right? And we grew our portfolio 3% per day and we only put $10 per month into a trading account you could grow to this 105k and honestly like you might be looking at it as like wow that's a huge number it makes sense statistically like if you look at this 3% growth from $500 in a year you could take it to 105k easy or even above that Right, but of course, maintaining three percent per day for portfolio growth. Right, I'm not saying like option uh, profits. I'm talking like your portfolio. Right, it's pretty hard to maintain because sometimes you're gonna have red days, but it's pretty it's pretty doable. It's very doable. Even two percent, seventeen k. That's not bad at all. So that's definitely you know definitely look at that. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's never, you should never have in your mind how many, how many trades I should do each day, because each day will be a different situation compared to the next or the prior, um, situation. But, um, okay. Next question. Next question is, no, next statement is Wendy's definitely, if you have $5 in your pocket, and Spartan said that Wendy's is trash. I'll be honest with you, I do like Wendy's uh, spicy chicken nuggets, but that's just a personal preference. How many contracts do you usually buy? Um, I buy upwards of 100 contracts, right, per trade. Basically, I don't go according to how many contracts I buy. I go according to my percentage of my portfolio. I normally trade only 2% to 5% of my portfolio because my portfolio is already big. But before it got big, I used to only trade 10% of my portfolio in each trade. Right, so that's basically to answer your question, that's the best way I can answer it. I just go according to um, the portfolio percentage. Uh, you guys suggest me before I get to the next uh, statement or question 
Do I get a Big Mac or do I get Double Quarter Pounder? I feel like a Double Quarter Pounder would be so much more filling, right? I definitely think so. Um, but okay, Tendu said, my losses are greater than my gains. I bleed. I be bleeding out. Ten percent total. Okay, so if your losses should not be, uh, basically, what you want to do is you want to always set yourself a stop loss that you're going to set stick to. So whether it be ten percent stop loss or twenty percent stop loss, look at your account. And the bigger the account, of course, the bigger the stop loss you can have, right? Because um, you can, uh, you have more capital to regain your, um, what's it called, your losses by. But definitely look to have a stop loss that's less than twenty percent and start taking profits at five percent and ten percent. And when you do that it's going to end up turning your way. That's how I ended up becoming profitable. And from the servers, respective ser servers that you guys are in, I'm only in servers with good analysts. If there's a server with bad analysts, I don't join it, even if they try to pay me, right? So there are analysts that do offer a lot of good alerts, right? And while you're learning how to trade and stuff like that, you could trade based off of their alerts and do pretty well. So just remember, Start taking profits at 10%. And let's say you don't want to, um, let's say you don't want to, I know a lot of you guys are going to judge me for adding two, but I'm that hungry. But, um, did I not add it to my cart? A lot of people ask me, um, oh, uh, what if I don't want to, what if, they're, they always they always start whining like oh I took profits at ten percent or twenty percent, but now um, but now the contracts are sixty percent profit. Well, the thing is, you can't always predict that it's going to go to such a high amount, right? So, what you would want to do is, you would let's say your your profit goal is taking profits at ten percent. What you would do is, once it reaches 5% profit, you would set your stop loss to five, uh, to break even. When it reaches 10%, you set it to 5% stop loss. And when it reaches 5%, you set your stop loss to 10%, right? And you keep on moving it up. And this way, you have less chance of losing out on a lot more profits compared to just outright selling it. Um, but that's definitely one way to combat it. Uh, if that's what you're worrying about, you know, so. Uh, does 200 contracts get filled easily? I usually don't buy 200 contracts. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, but no, it's actually very hard to get filled. Where are fries? Why can't I find fries? A medium fry is five dollars? Seriously? Wow. Wow, amazing options. And yeah, uh, Isan said, green is green, rather take a profit than a loss. Absolutely. Because think of how many times your contracts have gone to 5% profit or 10% profit. And then right after that, it would go down to a 30% loss and 60% loss. You, like you guys can admit, uh, it, it happens a lot, right? So it's unfortunate, but... At least you learn from your mistakes, right? Oh my gosh, this looks so good. Hot Fudge Sunday. Okay, I'm gonna stop doing this. You guys shouldn't be 
overburdened with this, I'm sorry. Um, any other questions? Again, according to anything that I said, uh, but seriously, let me know. $23, dang. None of you guys have uh, questions at all? I'll give you guys a few minutes to ask questions again because if there's no questions then uh, uh, it should be getting off if you guys don't mind because tomorrow on top of trading after I trade I need to take a four hour freaking train ride back to my from my campus to my uh, home back in New Jersey so that's gonna be fun Uh, it's 2.59, I'll give you guys till 3.02 to ask any questions, if you guys don't mind. Um, I actually need your feedback. Was this live uh, as you guys expected it to be, in terms of, did you guys expect to learn and actually end up learning, or did it not meet your expectations? What could I have done to better meet your expectations? I do need to know so I can make my, you know, future live sessions better. So please, like, uh, let me know. It would be amazing to have feedback. I'm a person who loves getting feedback. So please, like, uh, for everyone that's currently in this uh, live session, if most of you guys can just give me some feedback on how the content was, if there needed to be more, if there was too much. I don't think there was definitely not too much, but... If uh, there wasn't too much, uh, if you guys actually learned, if I stuttered too much, if I didn't explain stuff too much, anything, just give me some kind of feedback. Be as brutally honest as you want. It only helps me out in the end and helps you guys out. And yeah, I definitely uh, would be better after a nap and a sandwich. I'm so sorry if I sound pretty low. And thank you again for saying it's amazing. I hope you guys actually found it helpful. Oh my gosh, it's going to reach at 3.40? And it's 3 o'clock? This is, by the way, how close it is. Look how close it is. But I'm in such an unsafe place, I can't freaking walk this distance. I literally, one, one, the first day I came to this uh, college, I stepped out of the campus to go get Popeyes since it was right across the street from my campus. A girl ran up to, uh, ran up to me, put her hand on my shoulders, and said, you might not want to walk out here because my friend literally got stabbed just a few feet across. I was like, okay, never mind. Never walked out of my campus like that ever again. Well, well I'm, I'm glad it was helpful. Uh, actually, that means a lot. Will I be training on Friday, which is basically today for me? Yeah, but I don't know if my volume, like trade volume, would be as much. A daily recap of my alerts. You know what? Um, I'll quickly go over. see let me go over one trade let's see hold on let, let's uh before I do that let's pick if you guys don't mind if you can just pick one trade to go over let me go over the options um, 
let's see. Oh wait, hold on. I could just easily just go to here. Okay. So today we traded a lot actually. Um let's see. I actually want to go over the IWM put we had here because I actually used the um I used uh what's it called? I traded based off of a supply zone, so let me show you guys. So if you go to IWM, right? I previously had this zone plotted out using the Heikenashi, the same exact strategy that I talked about before. And the time I posted the alert was literally right here. And the reason why I entered this trade is because this white box over here is the supply zone. And as you guys know, usually that's a zone where if we trade into it, you it would reverse more likely reverse from a bullish movement into a bearish movement right so as we touch this and i saw the increase in volume right and i started seeing selling volume coming in and seeing the price action i entered in puts i think like right around here right right around here or here somewhere around this area i just know i entered it entered in uh puts right here somewhere in this area it did start it did lose a little bit in the beginning but then eventually we broke down and i believe it went from 50 to uh no not even 50 that was the wrong trade uh 139 to 179 so that was a 29 percent trade yeah 29 percent trade so um from here all the way to here and then yeah, that's basically why I entered into that. Uh, it was just basically trading off of the supply zone, right? So, uh, since that we went over that pretty quickly, what I do want to go over is this loser right here we had today, which is the 425 call for SPY. Because I feel like if I go over my mistakes, you guys would learn from them as well, right? So, okay. I'm trying to think where I entered. And this is uh, just my alert server, meaning like this is where my bot is, where I send the alerts for, so just in case you guys are like, wait, you're on a server, you're showing a server. Don't worry. Uh, what was I? I said? The 425 call, right? Yeah, here it is. I entered at 1227. So that's when. I entered at 1227? Huh. Okay. Well, yeah, um, basically, I did enter at 1227. Oh, yeah. Okay, never mind. This makes sense. All right. So, uh, sorry for the delay, delay right? But, um, the reason why I entered in this is because we started uh, SPY again. Why demand zones are so amazing and supply zones are so amazing. This is a demand zone, right? And we started trading towards it. And obviously, since this is a very strong demand zone, I was expecting uh, SPY to reverse into the upside, which it did. It didn't necessarily reach it, but it almost touched it, right? As you can see right here. So. I was too, I was in class actually when this reversed. I would have gone to calls right here and I would have had a really good alert and profit for that. But I unfortunately was in class. So by the time I checked, I think we were, I was, we were trading around here. So I just waited for a big movement and I waited for a pullback to enter. So I entered right over here, right? I entered right over here into calls thinking that we were going to have a pullback 
and then eventually you will continue the momentum into the upside, right? But I was wrong. What I should have done was just, um, what I was actually looking at is this over here. I was actually looking for the break of this, um, of this tiny little trend we had here. And if we extend it to the right, I could have just waited for this to pump and then just draw back and wait to see if there's actually um, buying demand to make it uh, reverse back into the uptrend it was before. But I entered in and it just, it was a bad entry. I entered really without confirmation. So again, this is why you should not enter without confirmation. And that led to, you know, me getting into a risky call. Literally right after I entered it, a few minutes later, it just dipped. And I believe the contracts went from for 196 all the way down to 145. Right, but if I just waited, if I just honestly waited, right, I would have probably honest... I'm saying honestly way too much. I would have probably, um... I would have probably entered right over here and we would add such decent profit you know for the rest of the day so that's my mistake that I had to and hopefully you guys can learn that it's not good to um, chase trades and enter without confirmation a recap of the summary yeah I'll definitely look to do that um, more often, so I'll definitely do that. But uh, you guys have any questions? Any more questions? Alright, uh, I mean if it's fine with you guys, I actually would love to end the live here. It's been an amazing time with you guys. Uh, we started at what? We started at 1.30. It's 3.09, so this live was an hour and 30 minutes. And for those who actually stayed the entire live, I know Fletch did, and I'm pretty sure SI did. I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Uh, a few of you, Tendu, did as well. <laughs> I know you guys are so sleepy, and I'm so sorry to keep keeping you on for this long, but I hope I taught you guys stuff. Um, good night. Uh, regardless of whatever time zone you're in, good night. Hope you guys sleep well. I'll be looking to bring out more content, and this live was recorded. Okay, yeah, it's recording. So, yeah, um, good night. Sleep well. If you guys have any questions, feel free to message me. Um, but yeah, see you guys tomorrow or just the next time. This will be, of course, the last live I have till probably not next week, but the week after that. So. Night, you guys. Appreciate it. Again, my name is Kevin, and it was a pleasure having you guys.